thanks so much, Julian, for having me. And uh, thank you so much for setting me up with the virtually impossibly difficult task to present to you in 15 minutes why I think free will exists, why I think free will is a brain function, and a brain function that evolved, meaning that we can use animals to study parts of it, components of it, and try to find out how it works. The, there are two things that I need to get rid of or need to make unambiguously clear when we talk about these sorts of discussions and this topic. One is that there's no magic in the brain. There's no magic in our heads. That idea of the mind-body dualism was born by Descartes in 1647 and basically died with uh, Popper and Eccles' book, The Self and Its Brain, in 1977. So there's no magic in the brain. That's an important component. And what that means is that every brain state is a physical state. But of course, uh, a lot of people think that, well, if it's all physics, it's all deterministic, and we're just a machine running since the Big Bang. However, what we know uh, since about 80 years is that the world is not deterministic. We cannot predict the future uh, just based on what we know. And even if we knew, we could not predict it due to quantum mechanics. And there are people who think that quantum mechanics is not everything, starting with Einstein, of course, uh, who famously said that uh, the old man doesn't throw dice, which of course he does. And uh, in the last 80 years, there has been many different attempts to experimentally test um, determinism, and they've all failed, meaning the world is not deterministic. And what some physicists today say is that virtually every probabilistic event in this world is basically just an amplification of quantum fluctuations. This means also then that if the brain is not a deterministic bubble that somehow shields itself from the interministic world, that also the brain, in essence, is an interministic, indeterministic object. Now, what we don't know is if the brain can amplify quantum events to a macroscopic level, and this is, but this is part of what I'm going to be talking about today. So this means that the world is not a clockwork, but the world is also not pure chaos. The world consists of deterministic and of, in, of stochastic, of interterministic components. Basically, depending on how you look at the world, the world appears either more deterministic or more stochastic, but mostly it's somewhere in this in-between gray area where it's made up of stochastic and of deterministic components. And this is precisely where freedom comes in, because determinism isn't freedom, and just random chaos is also isn't freedom, but a combination of the two. That's how you can grasp what a physical um, representation or implementation of freedom could mean. Now, what does that mean with respect to what is generally called free will, and, and uh, what do people say what free will is? So Taylor and Dennett said, I could have done otherwise. Uh, Cyril in 1984, a little before then, me, said we could often have done otherwise than we in fact did. Or to say it with someone who's been uh, dead for a long time, David Hume, if we choose to remain at rest, we may. If we choose to move, we also may. So basically, these eminent people have framed the problem of free will in a way of decision making, of choice. And of course, choice is highly situation dependent. So for instance, imagine this situation. What would you do? Would you move or would you stay at rest? Right? It's pretty obvious that we're, we would all, in all likelihood, move, even though we have the very distinct impression that we should have the capability of choosing to rest. Now, other situations are more difficult. So in this case, the blue pill or the red pill, that's not an easy choice. And then whether to feed one offspring for it first or the other may seem like an impossible choice. So we have all kinds of ranges from the very easy choice to the very difficult choice. And now let's have a look at what kind of choices neurobiologists look like when they study how the brain makes these sorts of decisions. And one of those um, is our escape responses, in this case, the sea start responses of fish. The reason why we look at these sorts of responses, and the decision here is basically for the fish, should I stay or should I go, um, is because they're reproducible in the lab. So we, they're easy to study, 
I can always get them when I need them and observe them and then to find out how they work. And uh, they're called sea start responses and you can test them with any kind of fish uh, that uh, you can ever uh, observe by throwing a stone maybe on this side of the fish and what he will do is it will bend in this C shape, that's why they're called sea starts, making his head turn away from the source of the, of the wave in this case and then the, the fish can flee in the other direction. We know very well, because it's so reproducible, how the brain, the nervous system of the fish does that. It takes the sensory organ here and then transmits the information from the water into the largest neuron in vertebrates, the so-called Mautner cell, which then activates the muscles on this side and inhibits the muscles on the other side such that you get this C-shaped uh, body posture. Now, how important or how prevalent is this sort of reproducible behavior uh, in the wild? And here is something that you can see is called a rare predator effect. We see a tentacled snake eating a fish. Now, how does the, has anybody seen how the fish does that? I'll show you in the next slide. You'll see here. Look at what the snake is doing here. It's eliciting the sea start response in the fish to predict where the fish is going. So clearly, to behave reproducible is not an evolutionary stable strategy. Because if I'm in a competition and I behave in a way that's reproducible, then of course someone will evolve or something will evolve that will predict what I'm going to do next and will exploit that. And that's why if you look at different, more trickily and, and, and less easily reproducible escape responses, for instance in frogs, what you could see is that the frogs are reacting to a, a stimulus that's coming from the front, and those are just two different species that are showing this, and then the frog would be sitting in this case here facing the stimulus, and then sometimes would jump into this direction and sometimes would jump into this direction and sometimes in other directions. Meaning that from the point of view of evolution, the really critical component or definition of free will is the one by Ludwig Wittgenstein. It's the freedom of the will consists in the impossibility of knowing actions that still lie in the future. That's a critical evolutionary advantage to be able to not always do this, but to be able to behave in an unpredictable way. Now, how could one study this? Um, as I showed, the reproducible behaviors are not very good for that. Another way of looking at these sorts of, or, of decisions is to try and elimin eliminate all sensory stimuli because you could otherwise you could always say, well, the animal just responded to something. And so what you can do, for instance, with this uh, leech, with this medicinal leech, is you can dissect the entire nervous system of the leech out of the animal. And this little squiggly line that you might be able to see here, that's the nervous system of the animal, and there are attached electrodes that measure the nerve record, measure the nerve activity in the dish. And so what you see is, there you go, is activity in those nerves. You can look at any one of those traces, and this activity corresponds to swimming behavior if the rest of the animal would still be attached to the nervous system. And so even in the dish, the animal starts doing this and then stops. So basically now it's resting and then it starts swimming again. And it'll stop swimming. And it'll do this in a regular fashion. It does it, sometimes it does it, sometimes it doesn't. So there's nothing regular on it. And so even the isolated nervous system of this animal is producing these sorts of decisions on its own without guidance, without instruction from the environment. Now, another system that we study is the fruit fly Drosophila. And you see the fruit fly here attached with a drop of glue between head and thorax uh, to a clamp and th that holds the hook to which it is glued. And what you see is that the fly is beating its wings, it's moving its abdomen, its legs. You can even see it's moving its antennae. But the only thing that we're recording is th where the animal tries to turn, left or right. So we measure the yaw torque, that's what this is called, uh, around the vertical body axis. And so you can see this here. This is a time-lapse recording of 30 minutes. 
that the animal, and this is an actual data sequence, animal is trying to turn right, left, right, left, and so on. And it does that even in the absence of any stimuli, and we know which stimuli trigger the animal to go to the left or to the right. It does that in the absence of any stimuli that's telling the animal or instructing the animal to go left or to go right. So any m movement, any turning maneuver of those animals now is an action and not a response because there's nothing in the environment that tells the animal now you have to go left and now you have to go. Now, this alone doesn't really tell us if the animal is making decisions. It could still just be like a radio that's tuned between stations and you still you have you know, random output and maybe what the animal is producing there is random output. And so one way of testing this is by analyzing the data and see if it conforms to the mathematical definitions of noise, which means that it should be random. And one way in which we have done this is um, by evaluating individual turning maneuvers. And to understand what that is, I've uh, zoomed in here into those five minutes. What you see is a baseline fluctuation superimposed by these spikes in the torque trace. And those spikes correspond to body saccades. So if you watch uh, flies flying in free flight, they don't fly like a plane, they fly in zigzags. So every spike that you see here is like a zig and a zag. And we look at the interval of time between each zig and each zag. So it's the inter so-called interspike interval. And we use a mathematical me method that was developed to quantify how good a, na a random number generator is, and we compare the flies to random number generators. So in this case, um, we look at how far away from absolute random, from perfect randomness, is um, the, the sequence that we get from the flies, and we compare it to computer sequence. And the computer sequence is not perfectly random, but pretty close. And as you could have guessed from the size of the graph, the flies are not as random as a computer, even though they're pretty close to random by you know, practical standards, meaning it's very difficult to predict where they go. But Computers are better random number generators than flies. Now you can say that, okay, of course, this is a very simple model, and so we've increased the complexity of the model by having several of those so-called Poisson processes, having two together, two together with a filter, having uh, three together, and essentially n. I can't go into the detail of the whole, of the whole sequence <coughs> of studies, but um, what, to make a long story short, what we have found is evidence for a nonlinear mechanism that could, in principle, be able to work as a, an amplifier of very small fluctuations that do go on in the brain. Because these nonlinear systems, they co are composed of random and deterministic components, and they act precisely in this gray area between the two extremes. Now, we don't know how the brain of the fly does that but we're in the process of finding out where in the brain the neurons are located that performing, are performing this task. And what we're finding is that the neurons, are, are, the neurons of a very enigmatic area in the center, deep in the center of the fly brain are involved. It's a, the fly brain area is called the ellipsoid body. The reason is because, quite obvious, because the neurons are shaped in this ellipsoid round donut f shape. So those are the kind of neurons that if we switch them off experimentally, then this sort of nonlinear um, amplifier in the fly brain is not working correctly anymore. But uh, that's about as much as we know about the functions of uh, spontaneous variability in flies and how, how uh, the neurons are doing it. And future research will hopefully show us more of the mechanics of those neurons, how they actually are doing this. Now, what does that mean in conclusion? What does the spontaneous behavior of leeches and fruit flies, what does that have to do with what we experience as free will? And you might say that this is uh, fairly little. However, what, it, what I think it does constitute is a necessary, but not a sufficient criterion and prerequisite for having something that we would then call free will. It's sort of like the sand grain in an oyster that without which you will not have a pearl. So, Maybe that behavioral variability, the behavioral freedom that flies have, maybe that is sort of, or can be imagined metaphorically as a grain of sand, and then 
we have superimposed on that, our large brain has superimposed on that layers of, let's say, consciousness, deliberation, and those sorts of things that eventually developed in evolutionary time scales to um, what we now call self, uh, what we now call free will in humans. Thank you.